Morning. All right. Uh, oh yeah, that's that's what I wanted to say. So I I finished adjusting your your test two grades. So I uh, I finished adjusting your test two grades. I uh, decided I don't really need to post an overall grade. You can just add up your um, your grades for each part um, and then go from there, get your grade out of 18, and then you're done. Uh, I also, I um, it took me a really long time just because I had to go into, so for each and every one of you, I had to go into each part like I had to go back and Moodle was just driving me nuts. Uh, but anyway, so it took a long time. And what I did was I, um, I wrote comments and things on your uh, PDF and then I'll upload them as uh, feedback. Now, if your first name starts with an A or a B, that's how far I got, uh, then you will have your feedback already. Uh, and if not, it'll come after class. And so um, I wrote uh, I wrote notes and comments on the PDF you submitted. And that's really just to help you for future tests, right? So definitely, I mean, take the time. I took the time to make those notes. It took me forever. Uh, so, um, so definitely go through and have a look and, and, and see what's there. If there's anything that I'm, I'm kind of catching and commenting on, then of course that's something you'll want to correct for the next test and for the final. So I, I wrote notes and comments on the PDF you submitted uh, and uh, the feedback will be uploaded to your test two submission. Uh, I don't know what it looks like on your end. Hopefully, uh, first names uh, with starting with A and B. I only got to the Bs. Are done. I'll do the rest after class. So they will be done. Um, so if your first name starts with an A or a B, then uh, you can have a look and, and there should be a feedback PDF there. And if there isn't, let me know because then I need to, I don't know, do something, redo something, I don't know. Um, so keep an eye out for that uh, and I'll kind of check in if there's any issues next class. But um, Overall, I'm really happy with uh, the work that you're showing and I'm, I'm really happy overall with how with how the test went. So even though there was kind of you had me worried with that, uh, with all the messages after the test going, oh, I didn't like that at all. Um, even the, the different parts, you guys handled it like champs. So um, uh, Oh, parts one and two. Sorry, I got a, a message here. Uh, oh, that's weird. I wonder why those would be different. Okay, so maybe I will post the, an overall test mark. I'll have to adjust the settings. I thought the settings were all the same, but that's that sounds weird. Um, anyways, I'll 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 work on I'll work on those a little bit. But overall, really good. Uh, there were a few times where I wrote timeline and I had to stop myself from taking marks off. Uh, but I, I do want to see timelines mostly because it, it tells me how you're interpreting the problem. Right. And so 
uh, that is something that I want you to get in the habit of doing. And I know it's one of those things that um, doesn't make sense when you start, oh, I gotta do a timeline because she needs it. Well, eventually you'll start relying on the timeline uh, and it's gonna be a good tool. So that's just how it is. Uh, and yeah, just because it keeps catching my eye, uh, just to comment on if you can't see all your marks uh, for the test for each of the parts, um, then let me know and I'll, yeah. It must be a settings thing. I must have to adjust the setting. Okay, so uh, what did we do last day? Awesome. Um, for a little bit of review, we did, we talked about the calculator functions, right? So cool, uh, really fun. And we'll, we'll use the calculator some more in, in review here, but uh, we talked about uh, the calculator functions and we went through and we outlined what each of those buttons are and what type of input they need. It's really important that we input values properly. We also talked about, and I've got a, oh, uh, the rule of 72. This is not in the right order, by the way. Started with the rule of 72 because it's so fun. 72 divided by the rate, not as a decimal. Uh, it gives you an approximate doubling time, right, for any for any investment. And so it's just kind of a, a good um, guideline. And what else did we talk about? We talked about, um, oh yeah, continuously compounded uh, rates here. Let me just go to Mana. Ha and changing interest rates. We did like the mixed bag of tying everything from chapter five together. Just these little, oh, okay. And then you can have a changing interest rate. Uh, changing interest rates, or you can even have the special case of, and it's pretty rare, but of a continuously compounded rate. And I think now that I'm saying it out loud, compounded rate. I think we left off on an example that I said, try it on your own, and then I will finish it together. <laughs> it's all coming back to me. All right. So uh, let's see here. I'm going to just grab, grab this from last day. Actually, example. One ninety two, I think it is copy. Yeah. I don't want to take up a whole page with stuff from last day. Uh, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. So example 192 continued. So this is from last day. Okay. So 192 was 13, and maybe I'll bring this in too. Ah. Eventually I'll just have to bring in the whole thing, I guess, but for now. Squeeze it in. So 13 years ago, you borrowed $7,500 at a rate of 2.5% compounded continuously. Okay. So here, this is a special case because there is no F, there is no compounding frequency. It's con continuously. So it, it, we need a special formula. So compounded continuously, uh, we need this formula here. Okay. which is PV times E to the power of R times T. 
Now, what we said was, what would be, or what we wanted to finish was, what would be the equivalent annually compounded rate at which you borrow this money? So the bank could offer you 2.5% compounded continuously or blank percent compounded annually. And what we'll find is that there, there isn't that big of a difference, right? So it's kind of a womp womp situation because compounding continuously sounds so good, right? Ah, it's continuously just tacking on more money, continuously, ba, 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 ba. Right, and so here, uh, now we wanna change it to a frequency of one, right? Annually compounded rate. So what we found was that a, a present value of 7,500 grew to 10,380 and 23 cents. So now we want to find the rate that makes that happen, right? So we need to find, we need to find the rate that makes 7,500 grow to 10,380.23, and surely there was some amount of time in 13 years, 13 years ago, but also because the T year is 13, right? And so we have all the components that we need except for I, because that's how we're gonna get to our R. So we need to find the rate that makes 7,500 grow to 10,000 whatever uh, in 13 years, compounded, oops, compounded annually. This is kind of a, a simple question on its own, right? It's just making that connection between the continuously compounded and then we can go to annually compounded. So uh, we want to find I before we can find R, right? So here we're going to solve for, solve for I, then find R. So we've got the formula for I is on our formula sheet. I is the nth root, let me just, yeah. So here we have, boop, 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 boop. So we have I is the nth root now, n in this case is 13 times one, right? So it's just gonna be 13. n is time times the frequency, which is 13 times one, which is 13. So then I have the 13th root of 103823 divided by 7,500 that's under the square root and then I'm subtracting by one. You'll want to keep an eye out for in that feedback file. Uh, there was some notation you were doing the calculations correctly and it, and it happened quite a bit where uh, your calculations were actually working out to be correct. Uh, but what you were saying that you were going to do with brackets and such uh, was not what you were actually doing. So just have a look through that feedback once I post it. Um, uh, great question. Uh, we'll, we'll do it here. Uh, but just have a look at that feedback because um, that's something you'll wanna, you'll wanna fix. Okay, so to type this into your calculator, first you'll wanna find uh, this fraction here. And then just remember that that's a, the 13th root is the same as this to the power of one over three. So this, so I is 10,380.23 over 7,500 to the power of one over 13 and then minus one. So 
I'm going to do this. Okay, here we go. Uh, okay. I just don't love this calculator. Hey, no ads today. Okay. Maybe, maybe it's looking up. Okay. Uh, so I had, uh, shoot, 10, 10,380 and 23 cents. I think I don't have it anywhere. So hopefully that's it. Uh, divided by 7,500. So this 1.384, I want to raise it to the power of 1 over 13. So you've got that y to the x button. So hit that y to the x button. It won't actually do anything. And that's the annoying part with this calculator, I find, is that it doesn't actually tell you uh, if it has registered anything. So just be careful. And then because I want to put it to the power of 1 over 13, and I can't actually see what it's uh, putting in the power, I'm going to use brackets around the 1 over 13 just to make sure that everything is up in the power, right? Uh, so bracket 1 divided by 13 and bracket. Careful here because now it's only the 0.0769 is actually only showing one over 13. It's not until you hit equals that it'll do the, the power. So equals 1.025315122. So uh, to copy that down, I'm gonna do it on the side here on this calculator, uh, but I'm gonna just do the same thing I think I had the right number. So this becomes 1.384030667. We understand that it keeps going, of course. But then to the power of 1 over 13 is 1.02531512 minus 1. 0 0.02531512127. This is the same, right? It's just showing more decimal places. So then, okie dokie, this is our periodic interest rate kind of cheating because it's compounding annually. So uh, this is also our R. But let's just go through what we usually do. I equals R over F. F in this case is 1, right? So I have 0 0.025315121717. Of course, you might want to store that equals R over F. Oh, sorry, R over 1. Let's cut to the chase here. So then R is 0 0.025315121217. Depending on how specific you want to get, right, the rate is 2.53% compounded annually. Like I said, it, it gets to be kind of a womp womp situation because like I said too, 2.5% compounded continuously sounds awesome, but that's gonna be the same. So we get to the same result um, at a rate of 2.53% compounded annually. So it doesn't actually make that big of a difference. Right? So notice, so therefore, Uh, 2.5% compounded continuously is equivalent to 2.53% compounded annually. Uh -huh. 
Good. So now more review, but I want to uh, I want to do some of these calculator calculations, calculator calculations, um, just for practice. And I think the only example that we haven't worked through is kind of a big one in that chapter five handout. Uh, example 185. Yeah, because we did this one. This is the rule of 72. And then uh, <laughs> pretty sure we've done this one. I don't know. Oh, this was a calculator one. Okay, I think we did that one. And then uh, we did this one, we did this one, and then we did this one. So the only one that we haven't done or potentially two, but let's skip 188. Uh, I wanna do this big mumba jumba for review on using the calculator. I'll even do it on its own page here. <clears throat> so we've got Doug. Does anyone know Doug Burt Whistle? He's in the math department. He's really awesome. I'm pretty sure it's about Doug Burt Whistle. Um, anyways, he's really great. Uh, so Doug's original intention was to settle a financial obligation with two payments. Oh, you guys are having flashbacks to the test, I know. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to, instead of doing the calculations by hand, we're going to use the calculator just for some practice, right? But you'll see that the, the layout is the same. And I would argue that for these types of problems, it's probably quicker to just do it by hand. But um, I'll let you decide. So here we go. Uh, so he's going to settle a financial obligation hmm, with two payments. The first payment of 1,500 was due one year ago. Sounds familiar. The second payment of 2,500 is due three years from now. Okay, so I've got a year ago. Obviously, I need today as kind of a reference point, and then three years from now. Surprise, surprise, he missed the first payment and now proposes three payments that will be economically equivalent to the two originally scheduled payments. I took out another equivalent. I don't know why it was there. Um, and it was really confusing me. So I could cut it out. The replacement payments are $1,000 today, a second payment in one and a half years, and a third payment twice as large as the second in three years. Which of the second and third payments be if money can earn 8% compounded semi-annually? Okay, so first things first, let's draw a timeline, right? And so, and I want you to, to start drawing timelines for sure even though I was impressed that you guys were able to solve these problems without the timeline. Uh, so I'll, I will say that. We have a lot of different time points here. Okay, So we had a year ago, right? So one year ago, we have today, just jotting down the time points as they come up. Uh, one year ago, second payment three years from now uh and then the new payments are going to be today one and a half years and in three years okie dokie artichoke looks like i just need one and a half and three years right because there was a payment due three years from now but also the third payment is in three years. So, so they're both gonna happen here at the three year mark. Okay, so uh, maybe I'll bump this down just in case I need to write something above it. Probably not, but feeling a little cramped. 
All right. So now let's put the dollar amounts. Uh, and maybe what I will do, because I have the luxury of having different colors, is maybe I'll use green for the original payments, because then I'm going to have a new payment scheme that has to be equivalent to, to the previous payment scheme. So here I'm going to write down the old payment scheme. It was going to be 1,500 one year ago. And a second payment uh, of 2,500, right? And so here I'll just underline that that's in green. Okay, so we know that we're going to have to find the value of this thing probably today, right? Uh, I don't think it says what to use as our focal date, but it's going to be the easiest time point because otherwise you have to find the amount of time uh, between one year ago and one and a half years, for example. Now, you you can pull these arrows to any of these time points or even a different time point, uh, but I would recommend today. Right. So uh, I will use today as the focal date. Okay meaning all of these values have to be equivalent today, okay? So let's talk about the previous repayment scheme. What's that value today? Well, if I'm pulling this 1500 forward, it becomes a future value one. And if I'm pulling this 2500 backwards, <laughs> becomes a present value and I'll, I'll call it present value two because it'll be my second calculation. Okay. So then here, if I add these up, this is the total today of the original repayment scheme, right? And you, you did one or even two of these on the test. I, can't, I think one was simple interest. So you've done this. So Doug missed the first payment and now proposes three payments that will be economically equivalent to the two originally scheduled payment. So the replacement payments, and let's just draw a fresh timeline here. Sometimes I'll try to squeeze them on, but um, let's see here. One year ago. Today, one and a half years and three years. So, and I guess you don't need the one and a half years on here, but it's a nice reference point, right? Just to kind of see what's going on. Uh, the replacement payments are a thousand dollars today. Okay. So now I'm going to use, uh, let's use pink, I guess. Oh, I like to use pink for other things. Uh, I'll use light blue. So the replacement payments are $1,000 today. Okay. A second payment in one and a half years. And a third payment twice as large as the second in three years. So here, how I'm going to denote that is I'm going to have an X here, and then I'm going to have a 2X here, right? twice as large as, as the second in three years. So what we want to do is we want to know, uh, basically, we want to find X, and then we'll be able to find uh, what these values should be, right? Two times X is easy enough to find. So. Uh, these payments have to be equivalent to the total that's owing today, right? So the total value of the original loan should stay the same. Okay. 
So here this becomes a present value three. And the present value four. And these have to add up to that total today from earlier. Okay. So, all right. What else do we need to do to finish our, our timeline here? So we have, uh, we're compounding semi-annually. So that means that F equals two. Okay. And somewhere on here, I'm gonna calculate my I. I is 0 0.08 divided by two, which is 0 0.04. And it seems to be the same for all of these. That's another thing that you'll want to keep an eye out for is, uh, well, maybe the original payment scheme was at 8% compounded semi-annually, but then the new payment scheme maybe is at 9% compounded quarterly or something. So you would want to keep track of that. All right, so close. So now I need to put the ends on my arrows, right? Just so I have them available. And so N is time times the frequency. For this tiny arrow, it's just a year. So I can just do one times two in my head, hopefully. Uh, and just say that it's two. Even N is time times the frequency. Make sure that the time that you're using is the length of the arrow, right? So sometimes it can trip you up. Um, for example, if you were going from one and a half years to the three, well, that's not a very good example, is it? Because it's one and a half, um, but not for the reasons you might think. So here is going to be three times two, which is six. I'm going to do the, the number of compoundings on each of these arrows as well. Right, and so n is time times the frequency, which is one and a half years times two, which is three compoundings. And then finally, I have n is time times the frequency, which is three times two, which is six. Nice to be compounding semi-annually. It really makes finding the compoundings a lot easier. Okay, so we have it all mapped out here, what we need to find, right? We have all the information. If we had to calculate it by hand or if we had to use our calculator, you can absolutely do these calculations by hand. In fact, I encourage it to, for practice, uh, but let's practice using our calculator, right? So, to use our calculator, remember we have to list all the inputs that we're putting in as our work. And that's where I think maybe just doing the work by hand is a lot easier, but anyways. Uh, we will solve this using our calculator functions. For practice. Oh, that's a weird looking smiling face, isn't it? Still weird. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to list all my inputs. Uh, and I will cheat because I can copy and paste, but you'll have to list all your inputs. Um, and We'll kind of, we'll, we'll see how to solve this. The first part is not bad, okay? If I want to find the future value one, I have the present value, I have N, I have R, I have, uh, I have everything that I need to find the future value. So here, if I want to find the future value one, I need to input N. And remember, I just read across the um, across the calculator, right? But you have to list them in your work. The n, the interest per year, the present value. I think it's the present value, 
Where's my, where's my calculator? I need my cheat sheet, right? Going across here. Uh, the present value, the PMT, the future value. Uh oh, I need more space here. Where, where can I make a little bit of room here? The future value, and then I also need the payments per year and the compoundings per year. And remember, we had that beginning or end. For now, it's just going to be the end, and it's going to be the end for a long time, so I'll drop it. Uh, but I did want to introduce it last day, so I don't, no regrets. I'll regret a thing. So now we're just going to fill in all these calculator entries before we even go ahead and do it. So I know that n for a future value one is two. I know the present value is 1500. Now let's get in the habit of uh, using our positives and negatives, right? Because uh, the calculator requires either the present value or the future value. One of those has to be negative and the other has to be positive because it's always gonna be an exchange, right? doesn't mean it's negative money. It just means the direction that it's going. And we're going to use the convention that if money is leaving your hands, and in this case, your Doug, right? <laughs> um, so if money is leaving your hands, you make it negative. And if it's coming to you, uh, it, it should be positive. Sometimes it's hard to say. Uh, and for these questions, it actually doesn't matter. But it's good to get in the habit. So we have n is two. The interest per year, remember, is the rate as a number, right? So eight, because it's 8%. So that one, just keep an eye out on that one here. Because we, we found i, because that's what we're used to doing. But uh, now we, we don't need i, we just need the rate as a, as a percentage. The present value was 1500 and he was supposed to pay it. So let's make it negative, right? Just because it was supposed to leave his hands and it didn't. He held on to it, but that's okay. We don't have a payment, a regular payment amount. So don't be confused by a payment, like a lump sum payment. These are things like mortgage payments. So regularly occurring payments, car payments, et cetera, loan payments. The future value is the one we want to solve for. So I put a little star there. And you have the option of filling it with zero and then going back and computing it or just skipping it. Either way is fine. And remember, for now, we have the compoundings per year. It's two. It's compounding semi-annually. And then we just we force the payments per year to be the same. right? And so here, this is going to be two and two. So now we can uh, plug this into our calculator. Oh. I know the rules. So uh, now it made me lose it. No, it, it, I think we're okay. Okay. So uh, two, eight, negative. Okay. I, I got the numbers. They're in here. Uh, all right. So remember to fill these slots, right? So N is two. So what you're going to do is you're going to hit two and then you're going to hit N. And it just fills that slot with two, right? And then you just, you move on. I know it feels weird, but uh, we want eight in the interest per year. So then you just keep moving eight interest per year. And you're just filling these slots. Uh, the present value we said was going to be 1500. And we're going to make it negative because then we'll get a positive value for, for the future value. In this case, it doesn't matter which one is negative, but one of them has to be negative, so why not? 
the present value. Uh, zero for the payment. Because I've already put zero in the payment last day, it would just keep it as zero until you change it. It's just going to keep it as it was, uh, which is going to be really useful when you only need to change one or two things. But, um, but for completeness, I'll keep filling it with zero. I'm solving for the future value, but I like to put a zero in there just as a, a holding a placeholder. And then my payments per year and my compoundings per year are in a second menu, right? Remember, second menus behave a little bit differently, right? If I had to change this, it is two, but if I wanted to change it to two, notice that it lost the equal sign, I have to hit enter. So as soon as I'm in a second menu, I have to actually tell it to, uh, to do, to store it. Uh, so payments per year is two, compoundings per year is two. So that's good. To move out of the second menu, you're going to go second quit, right? And these are all things that we, uh, we talked about in detail last day. So uh, you might need to go back and review those notes from last day. But now we've filled all our slots with the information that we have. So now we can go and compute the future value. And so what you're going to do is you're going to hit compute future value, compute future value. And we get to 1,622 and 40 cents. So here I get to 1,622 and 40 cents. And because I have that star, it indicates that this, this was the value that I computed uh, that I found that way. Okay, good. Let's do the same thing for, uh, for this present value too, right? Like I said, I will cheat and I'm just going to copy these input values, right? So present value two, and I am going to just copy this here, copy, totally cheating. I know you have to write these all out. A lot of these are staying the same, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to practice. Uh, I'm, I'm a control freak, so, so I like to fill it in every time, but I'm going to try to just leave it, uh, leave the values that I don't need to change. I do need to change my n, right? My n is now 6. The rate is still 8. Right? Oh, I guess I should write a note not a decimal. That's why I highlighted it. I don't know why I didn't write a note there. So the present or uh, the interest per year, I, I can just leave it. The present value is the value that I'm trying to solve for here. The payment is still zero, so I can just leave it. The future value was the amount that I owed, which is 2,500. $2,500. And I guess let's make it negative just because, right, one of them has to be negative, doesn't matter. And then the payments per year and the compoundings per year aren't going to change for any of these problems. And so uh, you can just, you can just go ahead and, and leave them. Right? So the only thing that has to change here is the n and uh, the future value. Right? So these only two values need to change. Uh, so I'm going to do that. Let's go in. Okay. So my n was 6. So I'm just going to go 6 into n. 
and my future value was uh, 2,500. I'll make it negative just because it one of them has to be. And then I can compute the present value, compute present value. So I get 1975. Oh, this one's a little bit uglier to uh, copy here. 1975, okay. 1975, and then I have to go back and see what it was. 0.786314, 786. Phew. Well, it's lagging, so, wow, there. Good. Okay. So, uh, so now I know I can find the the total owing today, right? So now the total owing today. I don't need the calculator functions. I need a calculator, but I don't need the calculator functions. Uh, today is future value one plus present value two, which is going to be 1622.40 plus 1975.79, uh, rounding to two decimal places, because it's money, so I'm allowed to do that. If you're, uh, if you're talking about money, you're, you're allowed to round it to two decimal places uh, at each step. Okay, but not until you've arrived at money. So uh, this becomes, let's just do here, 162240 plus 1975.79. So the total owing today is 3,598.19. Okay. So what we've found is that, okay, this total has to be uh, 3,598.19. Uh, I'll use this in color. Here's where uh, this question kind of lets us down, right? Because if we have um, some unknown present value and some unknown payment amount, remember we need to have just one missing value. These calculations we actually would have to do by hand, um, but I did want to do some of it in the calculator, right? Just kind of a a bad example, but it's a good example for just a problem to practice. So let's keep going. So now uh, he owes $3,598.19. He's going to pay a thousand of that today, right? So what that means is that PV3 and PV4 must add up to 2598.19, right? And so we know. Therefore, uh, 1,000 plus PV3 plus PV4 must be 3,598.19, which also means that PV3 plus PV4, if I subtract 1,000 from both sides, must be 2598.19. PV3 Right, and PB4, right, and I'll just make a note here. We can't use the calculator functions with two unknowns. So we're back to the grind here. Okay. I would argue that for all these problems, I actually think it's way quicker to just do it by hand. But if you 
uh, prefer the calculator, that is totally fine. PV3 is the future value over one plus I to the power of N. The future value of PV3 is X, right? N is three and we already found I is 0.04. So we were set up to do these calculations by hand already, right? And then I'm just gonna lock in my memory palace here, <laughs> Uh, more like a, an open fort, uh, the two X with six compoundings. Okay, lock it in. PV4 is the future value over one plus I to the N. X over one plus 0.04 to the power of three. PV4, I'm going to do them kind of side by side here is 2x over 1 plus 0.04 to the power of 6. Hopefully I got that right. Can't afford to scroll, it's too laggy. So, uh, all right. I saw, so we did have a question just like this on the test, of course, and uh, and there, there were some hiccups still, so um, that's also why I wanted to go through and do this one. So here I can find 1.04 to the power of three, right? And so 1.04 to the power of three, and I'm just gonna do it here on, actually I need it later, so. 1.04 to the power of three, is 1.124864. I'm going to store that in one. And I'm going to do it double time here so that I can copy it out. So this is x divided by 1.124864. And that's what tripped people up because this is the same as 1 over 1.124864 times x. And just like when we multiplied fractions, we could smush them together. We can also pull them apart like this. Okay. And so one over this is, I like to use the one over x button. One over x is under the PMT button. And if you hit it, it just takes one over whatever's on the screen, which is exactly what I want. So, so I tend to use that uh, quite a bit. So 1 over x. And now this I'm going to store in 1 again because this is actually the value that I want. Store 1. Just overwriting my store 1. So this becomes 0.8889963567. X and this is stored in one. Okay. Let's do the same thing here on this side. 1.04 to the power of six. Let's do it. Clear. 1.04 to the power of six is 1.2653, blah, blah, blah. Uh, 1.04 to the power of six, okay. And it's a lot of back and forth here. 2x over 1.26531918. Here's a heads up, right? This is the same as two over that 1.265 times x. So this becomes uh, 2 over 1.26531918 times x. You can do that fraction, right? Just go to 2 divided by the previous answer. Remember the previous answer is if you hit second and the equals button, it says ANS. So you could store it or you could 
uh, use that answer function, which I'm going to use. So we want two divided by this. Two divided by second answer equals. If you don't hit equals, it'll just show the previous answer. Okay. Two divided by that. Okay. 1.58 something or other. Oh, rats. I lost it, didn't I? That's okay. No looking back. I get 1.58062905 X. And I'm going to store this in two, which is what I lost. Yeah. Uh, can I do ah, yes. store in two? Great. Phew. All right. So now what we said was. Okay, well, PB3 plus PB4, which we actually have some values with respect to X here, has to equal 2598.19. So I'm going to rewrite it. So 2598.19 must be PB3 plus PB4, which is. I'm just going to write store one X plus store two X. Wrap it up in brackets, maybe. Which is X times store one plus store two. And you're, it's okay to use the, the store numbers. And I'm just going to do it here on the side plus recall one. So I get uh, 2.30220567 times X must be 2598.19. To solve for X, all I need to do is divide both sides by 2.3. So X is going to be 2598.19 divided by the previous answer and I'm just doing it on the side here, but this is just regular math that we've been doing, so it should be okay. 1128.5655 uh, So in money, X must be 1128.57 and 2X is well times two uh, let me just eleven twenty eight fifty seven times two twenty two fifty seven fourteen trying to keep it all on that one page but that would be the first payment in one and a half years and the second payment in three years and we're done Okay, so that was kind of, I'm calling it review from last day, but it, it wasn't, I mean, we practiced the calculator, that was the review. So, uh, <laughs> kind of review for half the class. But let's take a little break and then uh, we'll head into chapter six. Let's take a, a five minute break. So um, break until uh, 1102, 11, I don't know, 1107. How about that? Good. We're back. Uh, yeah. While you were out, uh, I flubbed it. I I don't know. I must not have stored it. Too many calculators. Um, anyways, these values are correct. I checked them, uh, but when I what I had stored was not what I said I had stored. 
So if you want to go back and backtrack and, and correct these, it should be 2.4696 something times x, making your x 1,052.06 oh, after you round, which makes 2x 2104.12. Oh, uh, Good. So those are the payments. And to keep it all on that one page so I can start a fresh page for chapter six, we'll call it quits uh, for chapter five there. Oh, right. I'm really bad about putting up quizzes, um, but I do wanna have a quiz probably for Tuesday, but again, it'll be open all day. And uh, yeah, it'll be on, uh, on chapter five stuff, right? This later half, calculator functions, uh, that kind of fun stuff. Okay, so uh, chapter six is on annuities. <clears throat> Annuities are really just introducing these regular payments, right? So uh, annuities have regular payments. And by regular, I mean uh, regularly occurring payments, but I'm scared to spell occurring, so I'm not gonna write that out. Uh, Anyways, is it two C's? Is it two R's? Is it one? Anyways, doesn't matter. Um, so we have these regular payments. So I want you to think of kind of car loans, mortgage, right? Any, any kind of regularly monthly payments, biweekly payments, um, or, you know, you could have, uh, weekly payments if you wanted to. you could have daily payments even if you if you really wanted to that seems weird though uh but um even like uh there's a lottery what's that lottery where you get uh is it a thousand dollars a day or something like that so so some lotteries yeah set for life uh thank you um that would be an annuity. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to use uh, the, the set for life lottery. Right, so here you've got these regular payments um, that, that we're going to have to deal with, right? And so the only new part is that we have these regular payments. Now, the tricky part with these payments is that the payment frequency is not necessarily the same as the compounding frequency. But in order to do calculations, they have to be the same. Okay, And so here, uh, for annuity calculations, we uh, we might have a payment frequency that is different from the compounding frequency. Uh, so for annuity calculations, we might have, we might have a payment frequency and I say might, but usually we do, uh, we might have a payment frequency that is different from the compounding frequency. Okay, so notice here we're going to have talk about a, a payment frequency and a compounding frequency. Yeah, but for our calculations, they have to be the same, okay? And so for annuity calculations, we might have these dif different payment frequencies. Uh, I'll, I'll even start a sentence with but, 
Isn't that one of those things that we've kind of moved away from? You're allowed to start a sentence with but now? I don't think so. Uh, anyways, big no-no. Um, here I am doing it, it's math. Uh, so, but the frequencies, the payment and compounding frequencies and compounding frequencies must be the same to do the calculations. Must be the same to do the calculations. Because I, I just want you to, to kind of think about it for a second here. So you're making, uh, let's say you're making weekly payments, right? So payments being added every week, but then you're compounding monthly. So you'd have to wait a whole month and then it's gonna compound and add the interest. But now you've got these payments that kind of came in at different time points. And so it just kind of uh, throws everything off, right? And so what we do is for our calculations, these frequencies have to be the same. And um, the only way to get around that is we, we can't change the payment frequency because, uh, so let's say you are, you are a bank and you just, you call people up and you say, hey, I'm gonna need you to change to, to making monthly payments instead of weekly payments uh, because that's when I'll be compounding. That doesn't make sense, right? And so what we do is we adjust our compounding frequency to be the same as the payment frequency. Okay, and so here, <clears throat> To, to get the same, and I'll put kind of in brackets, the same uh, compound or the same frequencies, we adjust our compounding frequency to match the payment frequency. So to get the same frequencies, we adjust, we adjust uh, the compounding frequency to match the payment frequency. It doesn't make sense to go the other way around. That would be weird. Um, to adjust, uh, we adjust the compounding frequency to match the payment frequency. And in section 6.1, it goes through and it, it talks a lot about these special cases, but I just wanna go straight for the most important formula that you're gonna need for the rest of this course. And I know there's not, a, a, we don't have a ton of time left together, but uh, for the rest of the course, there's, there's still quite a bit of ground to cover. So. Um, it is something that we'll need for the rest of the course. So um, I'll go back to the kind of nitty gritty special cases as we need them. But for now, I just want to talk about 6.1, which is the effective and equivalent interest rates. Okay. What we want to do is what we established here is we want uh, our compounding frequency, we want it to be equivalent to, so our interest rate at our original compounding frequency, we want it to be equivalent to compounding at the payment frequency. Okay. And so let's see here. Uh, Like I said, I'm going to uh, just skip straight to the good stuff. Uh, now I'm hesitant. Eek. All right, 
trust your gut. Here we go. Um, I'll grab the formula from the formula sheet. <laughs> We've graduated to the second page, by the way. Fun. Oof. Okie dokie, artichokey. Here we are. Okay. And so these, these are all kind of special cases. I want to bring this in to our notes here. So these, we'll come back to these as needed. Okay. So these are all special cases. And we'll, we'll go through them I, after I introduce this most, most important formula. Um, okay. Because in the past, this is something that I, I haven't done. I usually go through in order and I introduce these, but then people get hung up on, on these special cases and that's not what I want. So here, I cannot highlight this enough, but let's write it out here. So we have I2, so like all our formulas, right? I'm gonna write out the formula and I'm going to talk about what all those inputs are. Oops. I2, so remember I, I is the original periodic interest rate, right? So 4% compounded semi-annually, I would be 0.04 divided by 2, 0.02, right? So I2, where I2 is the, and maybe I'll do it as a list, where I2, is the equivalent rate compounded at the payment frequency compounded at the payment frequency okay. so that's our our goal that's where we want to get to Right, because we want to change our, our uh, compounding rate to match the payment frequency. Yeah. So then I1 is the original periodic interest rate. Right, I, I1 now, we're calling it one and two because we need to go from uh, our periodic interest rate to our periodic interest rate compounded at the payment frequency. So the original periodic interest rate I1 is still going to be R over T, right? So that's, that's the I that we're used to, right? Which is just I from before. So I1 is our, where we started, right? It's our first I. F1 is the compounding frequency, right? So that's what we're moving from, and then we're moving to the payment frequency F2. Yeah. So F1 is the compounding frequency, which we used to just use F, gets confusing, right? Because now we have a payment frequency and a compounding frequency, right? So it adds that layer of kind of, uh, but once we've kind of settled down with these formulas, it, it's going to be, it's going to be okay. F2 is the payment frequency. Right. Uh, Oh yeah, so I skipped ahead. 
because uh, yeah, never mind. I didn't. I screwed up. Yes. Or over F. I know how weird. That was a weird thing to screw up on for me. Sorry about that, guys. R over F. It's still R over F. Nothing's changed. Just my sanity. Um, okay, good. So, uh, so this is what we're going to be using. So now we introduce this other layer for annuities. Remember when we have these regularly occurring payments, now instead of finding I, remember, so we, we moved from simple interest where we can just use R and T, hunky dory, easy peasy. And then we said, okay, now we've got compound interest problems, right? Chapter five. So now I need to kind of put things on hold and find I and N before I can do my calculations. Now we're introducing payments, right? Regularly scheduled payments. And so uh, now I need to put the brakes on again and say, okay, I need to find I2, okay? And then I can, so first I need to find I1 and then I can find I2 and then I can find N, which is now going to be the number of payments, right? And so um, to solve annuity or annuity problems, Annuity problems will require two extra, or kind of um, will require the extra step of calculating I2. Will require the extra step of calculating I2, right? That's only the case if the if the compounding frequency and the payment frequencies are uh, not the same. If they are the same, you don't need to. Although I like to just get in the habit of just always finding I two because then there's no question, right? You are always going to find I two, and then sometimes I two will be the same as I one. Uh, but it's always nice to just work through. Um, the same procedure I find, even if it's a little bit lengthier. So uh, it will require the extra step of calculating I2 and the N becomes the number of payments. Okay. Uh, and N will now be the number of payments. instead of uh, compoundings. Okay. So these problems are not the same as what we were doing, right? He owed uh, some amount a year from now or a, a year ago, and then he owed three, uh, some amount three years from now. Uh, those are not the payments that we're talking about. We're talking about car loans, we're talking about mortgage payments, uh, set for life winnings. Okie dokie, so let's do a little example here. Uh, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to skip ahead here. Uh, rats. These are all the same. Sorry, I just wanted to find, here we go. Just as an example, because I, I want to just show you how to find I2, but also how to pick up on it from, uh, from a question. 
So this is example 218. Suppose month end payments, and we're not, we're not equipped to solve this problem. We're just going to solve for I2. But I, I want you to see kind of where we're headed. So suppose month end problems, problems payments, 99 problems. Um, suppose month end payments of $300 are made on a car, are made on a car, whoops, a care, a car for four years. If the rate of interest if the rate of interest is 5% per year compounded quarterly, what is the value of the car? Now, I'm going to scratch that. We're going to kind of parking lot that for a little bit. And I'll replace it with uh, find I2. We're just going to use this to find I2. Okay. So here, we're seeing these regular payments of $300. And don't worry, you're not going to have to draw a timeline where you show the $300 monthly for four years. That's terrible, right? Uh, don't worry, we're going to have shortcuts for that. But what we have is we have monthly payments, right? And they happen to be at the end of the month, which is going to come into play later, where we need to distinguish between beginning and the end of the month payments. But for now, we've got the payment frequency is monthly and the compounding frequency compounding frequency is quarterly Okay. Notice from the calculator, right? We've already seen, right? Payments per year, P per Y, payments per year, that's the payment frequency. And of course, the compoundings per year is the compounding frequency. So what's nice is our calculator is actually going to do these adjustments behind the scenes. So we're not always going to have to do all this work. Our calculator is going to take over and, and do the brunt of this work, but it's important to know what it's doing, right? So, um, and it's, it just finds I2 somewhere in the background, right? So, uh, in terms of our formula, right, I2, let's see here, I2 is one plus I1 to the power of F1 over F2 minus one. So I'm just gonna grab this here and write it down. I2 is one plus I1 to the power of F1 over F2 minus one. Uh, it's been a while, so I'm just gonna confirm that. Yeah, good. So, I2 is what we're trying to find. Now, F1 is going to be the compounding frequency, right? And so here, this is my F1, and this is my F2. I think of it as this as I'm moving from quarterly to monthly, right? Because I want to force it to be the same frequency as my payments 
because I can't go the other way around, right? So, uh, yeah, just kind of put yourself in the in the bank's shoes for a second. And you can change the compounding frequency. You're in control. You can do whatever you want. Uh, but people tell you what payment frequency they want. Uh, and, and you can't really go in and, and change it on them. But So we have to adjust our compounding frequency to match the payment frequency. OK, so that's why we're going from F1 to F2. So however you want, like whatever memory things you want to use uh, to remember which one's which, uh, you just, you have to remember which one is which. You guys are open books, so you can, you can have whatever notes you want, right? But uh, so maybe this is, this is a good little summary to have. Maybe not the monthly, quarterly, that's going to change. So what we have is we have I1, so I1 in our case, we can do it separately or you can do it inside if you want to get wild. Uh, I1, yeah, I scrolled too far. I just wanted the problem. There. 5% uh, per year, oops, 0.05 compounded quarterly. So I'm going to solve I1 separately or if you want to do 0 0.05 divided by 4 inside the brackets, totally fine. Actually, you know what? We're adults. We can just do it. 1 plus 0 0.05 divided by 4. Or if you prefer to solve it on the outside, that's fine too. F1 is quarterly, so that's 4, divided by F2, which is monthly, so that's 12. And then I have to subtract 1. You have to subtract 1, otherwise it's going to make a real mess and you'll have interest rates of like 100% and more. So, all right, let's do this in our calculator. I would definitely recommend just doing it all in one Go, so go inside the brackets, do the 0 0.05 divided by 4 plus 1 to the power of 4 over 12, probably using brackets, and then minus 1, and then store that bad boy because you're going to use it for all your calculations later. All right, so we've got, oh, okay. Let's see if I can remember. 0 0.05 divided by 4. All right. 0 0.05 divided by 4 equals plus 1 equals to the power of 4 over 12, F1 over F2. Yeah. Uh, to the power of, I just had to check, I'm going to use bracket. 4 divided by 12, bracket, that's only 4 over 12, and then equals. Notice now this is the 1.004. So unless I subtract that 1, it would be 100.4% per month. Uh, not right, right? So that's why I have to subtract 1. And of course, I'm going to store this in 1. Just to have around for later. I, I did have a student who, who asked me one time, who's like, why don't you store uh, the interest rate in zero and then the one, two, three can just be for whatever. Mm, really good point. But uh, the zero is so far away. I don't know why I don't do that. Might be a fun thing to to try. It's hard to change your habits though. Uh, okay, I am going to have to do it on the side here because I cannot remember all those numbers, but 0 0.05 divided by 4 plus 1 to the power of 4 divided by 12 and then minus 1. All right, here we go. I2 is 0 0.0041. Four nine four two five. You have to store that because it, it definitely keeps going, 
right? And so you're gonna have to store this, and I stored it in one, but it always haunts me. Maybe I should be storing it in zero. Maybe it is more of a clever way to do it. Anyways, can't do it. Good. So now this is the I that we would use in our calculations. So now this, this is the I we would use in our calculations. So on the formula sheet, it's just going to say I, it doesn't say I2, but we have to find I2 and use it as our I. So I just want to take a look at the formula sheet just to show you what I mean. Uh, formula sheet. So notice here, these formulas are quite a bit larger than what we have been dealing with, but we're going to go through them one by one and we're going to break them down and they're not going to be so bad, right? Um, but notice that they all have eyes, right? So, ha, <laughs> the hills have eyes. I don't even know what that is, but uh, I think it was a movie. But notice there, there's eyes everywhere. Getting like uh, hints of the Handmaid's Tale slash 1984. Anyways, um, so I just read those all summer, so it's all here. Um, there's eyes everywhere, but this is where we, we and here you have to use I2 because you have to use that same um, <clears throat> payment frequency. N here is now going to be our payments, right? The number of payments that you're making. We'll get there. I'll, we'll kind of put that to the side. For the rest of today, I just want to talk briefly, so briefly about the rest of these uh, up here. But like I said, there are special cases. Uh, and you can kind of ignore them as long as you focus on this I2, okay? So maybe I'll just grab these, okay? So let's talk about, so this one we've, we've done. Okay. So now I wanna talk about what is this little guy here? I effective, so the effective interest rate, one plus I to the power of F minus one. So this is where we're gonna calculate um, the effective interest rate, effective interest rate, which is the annually compounded. So that's what I mean, it's a special case uh, it's changing some compounding frequency to be annually. Remember, we just did that earlier where we went from continuously compounding to annually compounding, and that's called the effective interest rate. So the effective interest rate is, um, let's see here. Um, effective interest rate, which is the equivalent annually compounded rate. But you could just use uh, a one as your F2 and then notice that it becomes the same formula here, right? And so here I wanna just say that you could use could use I2 equals one plus I1 F1, oops, F subscript one over F subscript two minus one with F2 equals one. They're the same, right? Just kind of hunker down and have a look, but you'll see that uh, the effective rate, why would I care about the effective rate? Sometimes, Right, especially Moodle questions will ask you, hey, what's the effective rate? So you should probably know what it is, right? And it's this special, special case, special, special. 
earlier, we could have used this formula. Whenever you have an E, right? E, E, natural log. These are all for continuously compounded. They're like extra, uh, extra special, special cases. Very rare. You don't need to worry about these too much. So these are like extra rare special cases for continuous compounding. Right. So if you have continuously compounding situations, then what you would do to find your effective rate is you would have e to the power of r minus one. Remember, so let's talk about it. The i effective rate for e to the r minus one this is going to be the annually compounded rate for a continuously compounded rate R. For a continuously compounded rate R. So you can go back and you can try uh, that uh, the problem that we just did, right? So for example, if you try e to the 0 0.025 minus one, do it on my calculator here, e to the power, where is our e? Oh, it's above the ln, e to the, oops. Oh yeah, this calculator is a little bit sneaky, right? It needs the, uh, 0.025 on the screen, and then you can take e to the power of that, and then minus one, we get to that same 0 0.025315121. That's it. Which is the exact same that we found earlier, except we had to do a little bit more work, right? So we already know how to get around these problems without actually calling them effective rates, but they are effective rates, so why not? <clears throat> Here, this I2, this special case I2, is if we want to move from a continuously compounded rate to some new compounding frequency that is not annually, right? So to some, some other compounding frequency. That's the only difference here. And maybe I'll just grab it because these are not fresh in my mind. I'll pretend like they were in the notes here. I2 is e to the r over f2 minus 1. This is moving from a continuously compounded rate r Rater, rate r to a compounding frequency f2. Okay. Notice that these are all in terms of continuously compounding. Very rare, but they're on your formula sheet, so we should talk about them. Finally, what if you want to move the other way? Right? What if you want to move to a continuously compounded rate from some, uh, from some compounding frequency? Pretend I knew it. R is F1 times the natural log of 1 plus I1. All right, this is moving. Moving to a continuously compounded rate r from a compounding frequency f1. Very special cases that you don't need to, if, if it helps, you can just kind of uh, block them out, know that they exist, but 
like I said, what I want you to focus on is that first I2 formula, that's gonna be our, our main event that we need. So here, uh, where is it? Yeah, this, wah, this is the formula that, that I, I need you to uh, be comfortable with and just kind of changing your, your interest rates for the compounding frequency to match the payment frequency. And then we'll be all set for the rest of the chapter doing these problems. So uh, I know I'm out of time. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know. But otherwise, we'll review this I2, but just kind of have the rest uh, in the back of your mind. Uh, and if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, have a great weekend, and I'll see you on Tuesday. Thank you.